Good morning. Um, thank you, Robert, for that introduction, and thank you um, for the UFM community. I'm, I'm very pleased and privileged to be joining you um, now. Uh, why do we gather here today in Guatemala City, in a ravine that was once a, neglect, a neglected wildland, to discuss the history and prospects for education in a free society? Why has an academic enterprise founded at the height of the Cold War amidst violent internal conflict risen from this ravine as one of the premier liberal institutions in the world? How, across the same five decades that have seen American universities succumb to ideological and institutional decay, has UFM built and maintained a world-class academic program where students and faculty alike are continually reconnecting their studies with the core philosophical foundations of a free society? I believe that these are not accidental events that are in fact the results that have emerged from the DNA of UFM, the genomic structure, so to speak, in which a deliberately chosen institutional architecture and a carefully cultivated organizational culture have entwined in a strong and stable arrangement that has thus far been resistant to epistemic, constitutional, or cultural drift. I want to call attention to the juxtaposition of the concepts of drift and choice. Drift is that state of affairs in which many of us pass our days, carried along by the prevailing winds of our culture, often trimming our sails to encounter the least resistance without being quite sure where those winds are taking us. Institutional drift is a similar phenomenon that takes place when whole organizations are either without an orienting compass point or are rudderless, lacking leaders who can steer through rough seas and keep an institution true to its orienting mission. Choice, on the other hand, is the inescapable business of a life lived in freedom and responsibility. In his book on the meaning of democracy and the vulnerability of democracies, the American political scientist Vincent Ostrom noted the importance of choice in human affairs. The phenomenon of choice, wrote Ostrom, of being able to consider alternative possibilities and to select a course of action is a universal feature of the human condition. Choice is a basic aspect of all adaptive arrangements. For Ostrom, choice entails having principles of selection, and these principles by which we evaluate the options available to us and choose among them need to be raised to consciousness, made explicit, if we are to understand patterns of order in human societies and act freely and responsibly and make good choices in them. Social orders, Ostrom tells us, are the patterns that derive from the processes of selection and choice. And these processes, he notes, are necessary because human beings have to learn to adapt to our dual nature as animals, compelled by physical and emotional needs, and as artifactual beings, beings who live in history, who transcend the state of nature, who forge civilizations. Living in society necessitates moral judgment about how we will live and such judgments rest upon our fundamental beliefs about whether we wish to be governed by principle or governed by discretionary authority. But who is this we that makes such choices? And how are the beliefs and values that shape our choices formed in each of us and in we as a community? In other words, how do we learn to be civilized? How do we learn to govern ourselves in order to achieve the opportunities that become available through peaceful coexistence? Such are the questions that the founders of UFM contemplated in choosing to establish a university in Guatemala 50 years ago, a place of inquiry dedicated to the mission of spreading the ethical, legal, and economic principles of a society of free and responsible people. The founding of UFM was not an act of asocial libertarian individualists, but was grounded in the recognition, as Manuel Ayal wrote, that freedom is a social concept. To a person alone on an island, in the absence of others, conflicting claims and the threat of force, I always asserted, freedom has no meaning. The governing statutes of UFM include, among the purposes of the university, decidedly social needs, to cooperate in the diffusion and enrichment of culture as a universal heritage, to contribute to the formation of educated citizens capable of serving the community in teaching, research, professional practice, and the diffusion of culture, 
to educate in the sense of forming persons capable of directing their own destiny and of contributing to the direction of the destiny of their community. UFM, as we see it today, is thus the product of choices made by its founders and by each generation of leaders who have succeeded them. To understand the source of UFM's institutional stability is to understand the questions, the philosophical principles, the prudential judgments, and the passing on of traditions that have given rise to this carefully cultivated place of learning. The transmission of the UFM code, its genomic replication, so to speak, to each generation of students, teachers, deans, trustees, and directors is accomplished in many ways. The inscriptions you see all around campus remind us that to be at UFM is to partake in a long intellectual tradition. The core curriculum all students must undertake through the Henry Hazlitt Center ensures that each generation studies those ethical, legal, and economic principles that are essential to making choices that make us free. The new CoLab and Liberty in Action program culminates the student experience at UFM with an interdisciplinary learning experience where students apply the principles of freedom to social challenges. UFM's resistance to drift rests in a series of choices made by men and women who have become part of a living community that requires each student, each department, and the university's administration and governing officials to reflect upon the choice between drifting and living free as responsible persons. The choices made day by day and year by year by members of the UFM community have been given boundaries by UFM's governing statutes, by its philosophy statement, and by the ideas embodied in these constitutional documents. But they also emerge from what we might call the virtues of UFM. These virtues are more than merely values. They are ways of being that embody the seriousness of purpose of UFM's founders. UFM's virtues, I believe, reflect especially the character of its founding president, Manuel Ayal, but they became much more than the personal qualities of one man. They are the shared cultural and spiritual endowment that animates the body and enlivens the heart of UFM. I will enumerate these in, as four virtues, and I'll address them very briefly in turn. Intellectual, convic intellectual conviction, constitutional wisdom, moral courage, and humble charm. In his inaugural address in 1972, Manuel Ayo reflected on the relationship between the institutions and the ideologies of those who direct them. This belief that our ideas give shape to the character of our institutions, that ideas are truly consequential, is a cornerstone of UFM's cultural values. UFM was founded to embody, refine, and transmit certain convictions that its founders had, not merely about the need for and nature of academic excellence, but also about the philosophy of social order and the type of professional training conducive to the peaceful progress of civilizations. I'm quoting there from um, Musso's inaugural address as president. In the 20th century, universities around the world have become vectors of transmission more for socialism than for liberalism. The founders of UFM deliberately sought to create an institution that would re-enlist the arts and sciences in exploring the truth that people and societies will flourish best in conditions of liberty. But why choose a university? And how did the founders of UFM come to hold their belief that ideas would be the key to positive social development in Guatemala and beyond? For over a decade before the founding of UFM, these young entrepreneurs and professionals gathered in their spare time to study and read and discuss ideas. They obtained reading materials from the Foundation for Economic Education and the Institute for Humane Studies. They attended academic gatherings of the International Mont Pelerin Society and the US-based Philadelphia Society and Liberty Fund. Organizing themselves as a small think tank, the Center for Economic and Social Studies, they forged a hardcore with intellectual conviction of the truth of the freedom philosophy. The importance of this growing intellectual conviction cannot be overstated. UFM, more than perhaps any other classical liberal institution created in the late 20th century, embodies Albert Schweitzer's observation that civilization can only revive when there shall come into being in a number of individuals a new tone of mind, independent of the one prevalent among the crowd, and sometimes in opposition to it, a tone of mind which will gradually win influence over the collective one and in the end determine its character. To oppose the crowd in such a way requires the second virtue I want to speak about, which is the virtue of moral courage. The original philosophy statement of UFM stated that our institution is coming to life in a world of conflict. 
Some may observe that this is always true of the human condition, but in the 1970s, Guatemala was torn by violent civil war and with most of, with most of Latin America was one of the battlefronts of the Cold War. Kidnappings, death threats, and murder were real possibilities in this world. It was, not, it was from necessity, not theatrics, that Musso donned a bulletproof vest to address the UFM community. What is the role of an institution of higher learning coming to life in such a world? UFM's founders believed that their purpose was neither to pacify the groups in conflict nor to join them, but was to place themselves beyond the conflicts of their time so that science and academic freedom might be preserved. The role of UFM scholars would be to watch, to think about, and to critically study present conditions in an effort to discover the probable shape of the future. It would be to strengthen the voice of reason when it seemed to face a universal crisis. The very fact of violence reveals a failure of reason and deepens the necessity for education. To resist the politicization of higher education in a world where schools themselves were targeted as sites for political capture required clarity of conviction and moral courage. It also brought forth the opportunity for the exercise of a third virtue, that of constitutional wisdom. UFM is an institutional order born of a set of questions about human nature and the world. Why is Guatemala poor? Why do the idols of socialism hold such sway over the human mind and heart? Why does political disagreement erupt into the triumph of power over persuasion? UFM would be an institution that would address these and other questions by partaking in the rich stream of inquiry in the classical liberal tradition. Where the theme is freedom, and it is given serious study and application in human institutions, people tend to flourish and reap the fruits of social cooperation and peaceful exchange. A liberal institution, like a liberal society, however, is not easily attained or secured. While we believe that under the operation of natural laws, such orders can emerge, life rarely presents conditions free from the darker expressions of human nature. Liberal institutions continually require the elevation of reason and choice over accident and force. They must most often emerge then at what we can call constitutional moments. Constitutional moments are historical events that take place in time and space when a group of people come together with a shared purpose and set forth a set of rules that will govern the actions they will allow themselves to take in pursuit of their purposes. We look with admiration at many of the constitutional moments in the story of the advance of liberty. We read today the constitutional artifacts of those times, the Magna Carta, the Mayflower Compact, the US Constitution, debatably the Spanish Constitution of 1812. Many of our libertarian friends speak of anarchy, and I think I'm the third person to say something about our, our anarchist friends, so maybe there's a question here for us today. Uh, they speak of anarchy, a world without government, as an ideal condition in which people would interact freely under the natural laws of property, contract, and exchange, but it is rare that human beings can consistently constrain themselves by natural laws. In the absence of universal self-governance, rules of right action and proper restraints on power are necessary. These, are, these restraints are needed when, wherever we gather and combine our lives, liberties, and properties to pursue purposes in common. We often neglect, when we study the sciences of governance, to reflect upon the constitutions that govern our smaller voluntary institutions. The charters of corporations, the bylaws of voluntary associations, the donor intent set forth in wills and trusts. This study of voluntary governance, the ways in which we constrain ourselves through agreed upon rules, is a field of study I have been working to promote through my own scholarship, and I believe the future of liberalism necessitates that we understand better the ways in which we constitute order that restrains rather than enshrines power. Over the last year, Gabriel Calzada has engaged many people within the UFM community and beyond in reading the founding documents of this university. And I encourage you to ask him to share that set of documents, including the fundamental statutes of the university. They're on paper, you can read them. In understanding these documents, you will discover that a sound constitution is part of your patrimony from UFM's founders. What makes a constitution itself stable, however, are the addition of the other virtues, the intellectual conviction that it rests in true principles, and the moral courage to live by its wisdom. This does not mean that we do not improve and change the letter of the law when circumstances make that necessary. 
but it does mean that such changes are undertaken with sobriety and prudence and are guided by principle. It is noteworthy that in the 50 years since the founding of UFM, its statutes have been modified only six times. Finally, I would like to address the virtue of what I will call humble charm. There are questions about how well UFM shares its learning and its belief in liberty with the people of Guatemala and with the world. I have heard more than once in my short time in Guatemala questions about whether UFM is truly for all the people of Guatemala or whether it is only for the rich and the elite. My opinion is that UFM has been from the beginning for all Guatemalans and for all peoples of the world. And that to the, the, to the extent that we resist institutional drift and continue to understand and renew the virtues that make UFM unique, it will continue to be a significant force in helping the ideals of liberty prevail here in Guatemala, in the Americas, and around the world. To speak of historical force, though, asks us to understand the nature of change in history. The founders of UFM had the conviction that certain ideological positions, like socialism and liberalism, are mutually exclusive. They also had the moral courage to stand in the less popular camp and the constitutional wisdom to create an institution that could stand the challenges of its time and place. Nevertheless, they also exhibited a humility and charm that has not diminished their sense of fellowship with their countrymen or with peoples around the world. Musso recognized and taught us all in his unique way one of the hardest lessons, that people who defend socialism and ideas with which we don't agree are often men and women of goodwill. To engage in discussion with an intellectual opponent, one must start with humility. No one has a monopoly on truth, Musso wrote. Differences of opinion with people of goodwill are not cause for enmity, but for conversation. Where differences arise from sincere disagreement over complex ideas, we need reason to adjudicate, but first we need to be invitational, to exercise hospitality, and to know our own arguments and be able to express them persuasively. There's a saying in English that you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, and this virtue of bearing ourselves among our enemies with humble charm is indispensable. Can UFM stand another 50 years without institutional drift? Can we learn to better embody these virtues of intellectual conviction, moral courage, constitutional wisdom, and humble charm? I believe it is possible, and I believe it is imperative. In concluding, I would like to reflect again on the unique geography of UFM. For so many classical liberals and libertarians who visit UFM from other countries, the comparison of UFM to Galt's Gulch of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged novel are inevitable. But I have a different view of this beautiful ravine. UFM is not a place where the remnant of civilization can come to live out some liberal utopia. UFM is not a place for the remnant, but it is instead a sending institution for the future. The founders did not design UFM to be an ivory tower separated from the world, but to under undertake the investigation, study, and teaching that would in fact help us make the world better, more prosperous, and more free. UFM is deeply embedded in a particular society and a particular culture. Its presence in Guatemala has an impact in this time and place. But the work of UFM and its faculty and graduates also reaches far beyond this country. The alumni of UFM are working and living around the world at the top of their professions. And visitors to UFM seem always to return home and recruit one or two more friends to come see and taste the fruits of this imp seemingly impossible dream of a small group of people who looked around at their world and made a choice to dedicate their lives and fortunes to make it better. I am honored to have an opportunity to share in this dream and this journey, and I invite each of you here today and those of you online watching, I hope, from all around the world, to think deeply about the importance of what we do here, to take pride in the broad ripple effect it is having in our world, and to renew your personal and professional commitment to ensuring that the ideas of UFM continue to have significance and positive consequences in Guatemala and far beyond.